Mike, can you save Bud Light? Yes. All right. <laughs> we'll get to that. For enough money. <laughs> we'll get to that here a bit later, but first, the booze news. In beer, we have a slight, small Anchor Brewing update. So, what's happening with Anchor? By the end of January, they were supposed to have decided what the winning bid was going to be for the way they have broken up Anchor. They're selling the real estate separately from the intellectual property, from the equipment. And so one buyer could buy all of it or they could break it up. And it's interesting, you know, the news that we covered, the workers were trying to buy it and they backed out in January. They just weren't going to be able to come up with the capital because apparently the bids were really high. But uh, two interesting things have occurred. One is that one of the bidders is apparently a venture capital group that, interestingly enough, includes the guy that did Pete's Wicked Ale from the 90s and Fritz Maytag himself. Mm. So um, you don't know there's some really evil people bidding on Anchor, but it's possible that Fritz Maytag could buy his company back along with the guy from Pete's Wicked, and that would be a really beautiful resurrection of Anchor Beer. But it we're going like to know a lot of work for a man in his 80s. Yeah, I mean, he sold it, and they torched that thing into the ground yeah. quickly. He's going to do a lot of rebuilding. Like that's got to be tough for an old man. Yeah, and I don't know. I mean, what the, the people that we have talked to in the industry say that there was a legitimate problem with Anchor in terms of the equipment mm -hmm. being antiquated. And when Fritz came in, he rebuilt everything and was all top of the line, et cetera. But it sounds like there wasn't a lot of updating that occurred over the past you know, 20 some years. It's expensive to update equipment. You run it until it basically can't run. So that, I get yeah. it. Which basically means then everything needs done at once, which is then even more expensive, but that's generally how it goes. Yeah, so probably buying the equipment might not even make sense. Really just having the intellectual property, it would be great if that was back in Fritz's hand, back in the hands of somebody that wants mm. to bring that beer back and, and do something good with it. But um, they anticipate making these announcements soon, sometime before the end of April. So we'll know soon whether Anchor will be resurrected in some sense or it is uh, just dead, dead. When we know, you'll know. In other kind of beer adjacent news, Ireland is adopting the world's strictest health labeling claims on alcohol over any country. So starting in 2026, all bottles of beer, wine, liquor will have in big bold letters Alcohol is known to cause cancer. Think about uh, modern oh, day cigarette um, cartons. Yeah. So, Mike, good, bad? Who cares? <laughs> I mean, who cares that it causes cancer? No. Or, or who cares about this labeling stuff? I care that it causes <laughs> cancer, but clearly I don't care enough. <laughs> and sticking it on the goddamn label isn't really going to make a difference to me or not. I think that the knowledge uh, that it's bad for you. Sure, that's useful. And in cigarette companies, you know, there's a certain amount, makes a certain amount of sense because of all of the uh, fuckery that they did for decades and decades mm -hmm. to lie about their product and bury the fact that it was carcinogenic as hell. Yep. So with cigarettes, I kind of get it. There's some punitive stuff going on there. With beer, like we have warning labels right now. You know what they say? Because no. I don't. Oh, no. Uh, you know, don't drink it pregnant? Yeah, you know, right. But you drink six of these and um, you're going to drive shitty. You know, you shouldn't get hammered while you're pregnant. Whatever. We know that. <laughs> you can stick whatever label you want on whatever. It's just going to busy up the packaging and it's not going to change what one person does about anything. It's not going to stop me from drinking like a fish next time I go to Ireland either. Right. That's for damn sure. Uh, in wine news, we have another update for you. If you recall from our December episodes, there was some chicanery going on in Napa Valley. The FBI launched a massive probe that put a call out for like 40 different people specifically that they subpoenaed for information. And it was a huge scuttlebutt. About a month after that, it has just come out now, but um, it happened a month after that in December. So in January, 
a CEO of a top winery out there killed himself with a gun outside of the winery grounds right next to his car. It was ruled a suicide. Yeah. Uh, this news is relatively new. And to add to it, more information is finally coming out about what exactly is happening out there, uh, or at least what has uh, uh, spawned the reason for these probes to be happening. Mike, I don't think it's MILF Mountain. I am so disappointed. I, I think that my speculation that this had something to do with a MILF uh, sex ring of some sort, I thought that it was a good prediction, and I would still prefer that that's what was going on. But um, it sounds complicated. It is. Who's, who's doing what? So basically, it's a battle between the rich billionaires that own the wineries in Napa versus eco-terrorists. And involved in the middle of that is obviously lots of money and bribery and shady backroom dealings. And who got caught up more in it than anything is the Napa County Supervisor, who has stepped down as of this week uh, because he's becoming under the most scrutiny. And I have to speculate that it's based on him taking massive amounts of bribes in order to push the eco-terrorists away and give the billionaires whatever they want. When your co-defendants look at the indictment and what they've done and start killing themselves, mm -hmm. it's never a good sign. Mm -hmm. You're not a good... Who decides what, what makes somebody an eco-terrorist versus environmental activist? Well, the eco-terrorists have done such horrific things as outlined in this article, such as getting on their dirt bikes and tearing up the property of these rich people. Terrorists! <laughs> Making, making vague threats such as, quote, I'd like to see that vineyard burn down, but not actually burning anything. That oh. makes them terrorists. Basically, they're hurting these rich billionaires' feelings. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, do I believe that the eco-terrorists, quote-unquote, environmentalists, environmentalist. do I believe that these wineries are probably net negative versus the current conditions for wildlife? Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably. Probably. Do I care that much? No, but would I rather see billionaires get it stuck to them? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that I agree with these environmentalists, but uh, I think that I'm on their side if I gotta choose sides. Same, I'll always side against a billionaire. I also suspect that among them, there's some MILF. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly, it is Napa after all. Yeah. In spirit news, spirits are at a crossroad crisis. Spirits are continuing. Oh, no. <laughs> they're continuing to destock, down trade, and de premiumize. Basically, meaning spirit companies, spirit companies aren't making money. Profitability is go. They're still making money. Are who are we kidding? It's global corporations, but they're making less money, and they're real sad about it. So the industry insiders are looking at this, and it's going to be a while before growth returns for the spirit industry. But the bad news is, bad news is that RTDs look like they're here to stay, and it looks like the only path to growth in the short term to medium term for spirit companies is RTDs. And they make less money on a six pack of gin and tonic than they do off of a bottle of gin. So is this good? Are we gonna see a major shakeup in the spirits industry as a result? Because no, the spirits industry is largely on premise based. It's selling bottles to bars. However, if you're selling cans, that's more of an off-premise, selling things to consumers via retailers, which is less profitable for the spirits industry. So is there gonna, a major shakeup is gonna result? Is there gonna be less splashy parties for industry insiders? Is there gonna be a massive upheaval in how Jim Beam gets fucking packaged and sent to you? Um, you know, the spirits industry has seen generational ebbs and flows so yeah i mean they could be they have been riding a really good wave for a while mm -hmm. and maybe it is just looking bad from a generational standpoint for liquor mm. but i also wouldn't write off those rtds i mean is that is it bad yes it is in the sense that they're disgusting and also that it just further diminishes my faith in human beings and my fellow Americans, because if you're too goddamn lazy to mix your own cocktail, then really quit drinking and do something else. But find the thing hobby. with, find a new hobby. <laughs> Watch golf on TV, <laughs> for Christ's sakes. But 
Um, there's all kinds of crap that you can stick in those RTDs. I mean, there's all sorts of cheap ingredients. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't write off the profitability of those. I understand that it's your They'll profit. find a way to make them profitable. Yes. If that's their only yeah. option, they will do yes. it. If we know anything right. about capitalist corporations, yeah. they will find a way to yeah. take money. Yeah. That's a good point. I do like the convenience sometimes of having a gin and tonic in a can already made. Generally, that's when I'm walking down to the corner store and I buy a single can and I walk immediately outside and open it. I understand <laughs> that. Yeah. If I'm at home, sure. give me my nice gin and a good bottle of tonic. And sure. Here we go. You're walking down the street, you're driving to pick your kids up at school or whatever. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, if you're just hanging out at home, you can't. Oh, no, I have to have the gin and the tonic. I don't know how to, I don't know how to combine these two things. You're about to get us canceled by uh, Mad, Mothers Against Truck Driving, but, you know, <laughs> it's fine, I guess. Gin and tonic is, I guess, the apparently the best road soda if you're going to be uh, booze cruising. Yeah. Not that we condone any of that because we do not. Responsible drinking is important, and it's almost as important as the malt you choose for your brewery, which is why we use malt in Europe here at Urban Artifact. Are you familiar with malt Europe? I've heard of them. <laughs> <laughs> We've talked about it a couple of times. Yeah. I love me some malt Europe malt. We use it in our beers. It's used in more German breweries, beers than any other malt that I know of. Um, so, you know, do what the Germans do and get the good shit. In retail bar news, Mike, would you believe that employment no. is <laughs> employment in the hospitality industry is back to pre-pandemic levels? Why doesn't I, it feel like it though? I wouldn't believe it from the service I've gotten lately. <laughs> <laughs> What's, what's going on? Like, why does it not feel like things have gotten any better, but somehow we're at pre-pandemic level staffing again? I don't know. I think uh, that also involves it, people. COVID changed so much about how people did everything and almost never for the better. Hmm. So I think that it just... Um, I mean, retail service in general, not just actually, you know, bars have had fine service lately, but um, I, I, th th there's something that got lost in that several year period of time. And I don't know, a lot of people just don't, um, they don't care. know how to do their job anymore. Mm. You know, they don't care. Uh, and, and, and that's, I don't, it speaks to something bigger. I mean, there's like the retail experience across the board has gotten greedier and more unpleasant. It feels way more transactional. The veneer yeah. of pleasantry is completely stripped away. And it's just, yeah. you're looked at like a purse more so than a human anymore and, and vice versa. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. I haven't really thought of it that way. I've always kind of just... It, to me, just, I don't know, it just doesn't feel the same. It feels less fun all the way around. And yeah, maybe that's like these prices are just, fun. Yeah. That's yeah. part of it. But yeah, I don't know where my servers go. I mean, somewhere in the past several years, they must have built an additional room on all the restaurants that I'm in because my servers seem to just disappear completely, you know? So, I don't know. Aliens, perhaps. I think it's aliens. I mean, we did just have an eclipse. Yeah. Mike... Bud Light isn't doing great. They have not regained their 30% so sales loss. They've lost billions of dollars. We've talked about it countless times. Skid Rock basically is a is a world destroyer. He is um, mm -hmm. he is uh, Luke Skywalker, and Bud Light was the Darth Vader ship. What what do you call that? Death Star. You're the, <laughs> the Death Star. Anyway, that botched you're the, analogy. You're the science fiction nerd. Like you're gonna ask me that shit? I'm just trying to play it cool, Mike. I'm just trying to play it cool. So Bud Light comes to you with their, um, you know, vast amounts of money, and they say, Mike, you know what's up. We need you to save our brand. What are you going to do? For enough money, I can do damn near anything. So first of all, I'll say that to uh, AB and Bev. I, to me, first of all, I would fire everybody that's running their marketing right now. <laughs> They have got that um, whole like campaign with the NFL with some stupid tagline that is. Um, do you remember what the tagline is? No, but I'll look it up. Something right about Sunday, but it doesn't. Easy to Sunday. What the fuck does that even mean? 
I have no idea. It's ridiculous nonsense. It sounds like it was written in Japanese and translated through Google uh, to become your multi-million dollar ad campaign. The tagline is called Football, Bud Light, and Sunday Go Easy Together. Okay. And the name of the campaign is Easy to Sunday. Fire all of those people. <laughs> Step one. Just call it Sunday Fun Day. We already have that anyway. You don't have any fucking original ideas, Bud Light. Just steal that one. Anyway, continue. Step two, I think that it was a mistake to take their branding into this territory where it is. I think the cans look stupid. Mm -hmm. And one of the great things about Budweiser as a company was that the label was iconic and they changed it, they updated it, but a Budweiser label looked like a Budweiser label from the 19th century until AB InBev started completely greeding out. And they changed that- In the that, 2000s it got changed. Yes, they changed that uh, Bud Light can to like a blue can from the kind of classic iconic one that, that they have had. And yes, they used to do a lot of sleazy kind of predatory ad campaigns, but they were funny. Beer commercials for the used time. to be funny. For the, Correct. For the time and place yeah, and the I'm situation not saying, and I'm what not, modern, what humor was back then, yes. I'm not saying that they hold people, up. People would talk about Bud Light commercials after new ones aired the next day. Correct. That one they aired in the Super Bowl, nobody even understood that gibberish. So, I would go back to the iconic can. I'd go retro Love on the can. Idea. In that Love case, that. retro meaning like the 90s. No, I mean, what Miller Lite, when they recently switched from that gross ass ugly blue can they had to the all white, which was their retro look, they saw double digit increase in sales just by going with the retro look. And it looks better. I think Miller Lite tastes better in that white can, <laughs> which I know it's the same crappy liquid, but somehow I feel better about drinking it because it just looks better. It's iconic. You do an ad campaign that is actually funny. Mm. You know, you have to not cross lines in terms of, uh, you know, making it look healthy to drink or et cetera, et cetera. But we do drink because it's fun. You know, it's a recreational thing, and that's particularly true of a beer like Bud Light that tastes like piss. Mm -hmm. You know, you're only drinking it because you're boating or you're golfing or you're just hanging out with friends and, you know, you want to be able to drink 20 beers. Um, that's two motorized vehicle drinking references you've made in one, one episode. <laughs> Again, we do not condone driving things and drinking. You did a golf cart? I didn't know people drove those sober. You did a car one earlier and then you did yeah. the boat. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, golf cart doesn't count. That's electric vehicle. Yeah. Everyone knows electric vehicles don't count as actual vehicles. Right. That's why I meant you pick your kid up with a G&T <laughs> in an electric car. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I get it now. It's legal. So I would do an ad campaign that reminds people Bud Light is fun. And I would punctuate that by bringing back that can that you associate with Budweiser and the label and the history and their tradition and just back when it was fun, man. So I, I, love, the, I love the retro can idea. My worry with the other side of the pitch is that I don't trust them to get it right. No. And if you try to do a Budweiser is fun humor thing and you drop the ball, you're either getting canceled again or it's just gonna fall on deaf ears or just come across super cringy. Like the Bud Light Genie is the most cringy thing I've ever seen. It's yeah, terrible. well they couldn't get worse. No, that's true. So to me, I think, I think the answer is um, the, you, you need to address what happened and have a backbone, because that would have solved the fucking problem in the first place. Yeah. Be like, we stand behind Dylan Mulvaney. She loves Bud Light. We love her in a story. Then move on, and people will forget about it. Yeah. So I don't think that they can, you know, a way to take a bully's sails away, the wind out of their sails and bullying you is by owning the insult. I think we've gone too far away from it at this point in time to like own the insult, especially now that Kid Rock yes. has even come out and said like, oh, I like Bud Light again or whatever. So to me, you just go full dumbass 
Bud Light, Bud Light. You just go full America. And you go, you try to cut through all the bullshit. I love the retro brand, because I say take that back, the 1990 can or earlier, bring that back, and just do an ad campaign where you just show motherfuckers from America, and you just slap the word American on it, and then at the end of the episode, you throw up a big Bud Light can, and you say fucking American, you ended, Bud Light is America. Drink America. Boom. Done. That's my ad campaign. It's called Drink America. As part of those fr photos that pop up, one of them has to yeah. be Dylan Mulvaney. One of them has to be Kid Rock. Throw in a couple other controversial opinions, maybe a, 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 a drag queen. You put in some other motherfuckers that like stir people up. Unification. I mean, when, yes. you, poll, when, yes. you, when you poll people... You do unification, uh, but with what, a little bit of a funny bent to We it. are all sick of... Being pissed off at each other all the time. It, exactly. Yes. yes. So yeah, I, I I could see that. Although I mean, aren't they already every July? I there's two problems. Number one, it's not an American company. Well, that's true. But, not anymore. But they still hammer America like it's their own. Well, yeah. I mean, like every July, they change the name of Budweiser to, to America. America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do do that. And you know, they've only been doing it since they were an un-American company. Yeah. So. You know, I mean, they're well, the, already trying that shit. The key to me is tone, though. You have to yeah. do it. You have to do it with almost a halfway. Uh, yes, kind of, uh, yeah. it has to be kind of poking fun at ourselves, kind of way. Right. Like putting Dylan Mulvaney next to Kid Rock is like a good way to kind of poke fun at yourself. Because if you do it 100% serious, you're gonna look like a yeah, diva. Uh, absolutely. To me, it's the level of satire, self-satire that Starship Troopers is. Star Trek Troopers is an amazing satire of Nazis, but it's fun and entertaining and Nazis like it, which is hilarious because the whole movie's ripping them. That's what you do with Bud Light. You make it so that people that get it, get it, but if you're too stupid to understand it, you're still going to like it anyway, even if it's making fun of your dumb ass. That's what I want out of Bud Light. That's how I think you save it, but that requires a lot of nuance and I don't think they're capable of that anyway, so. Well, where did all the good advertising companies go? I mean, they all started Liquid Death. God, I guess. They all make one <laughs> drug commercial that involves somebody running through a field with flowers and uh, buy Puflomax. Stick it up your ass and you'll feel better. Run through these flowers. Yeah, for these diseases that are just like seven letters of acronyms. And yeah, commercials also used to be fun. In stock update news for our final bit of information two things. One, uh, ticker symbol Bud, which is Anheuser-Busch. We are sitting down about 8% for the year so far. It's looking like it's going to continue to trend down for a little bit. But with on-premise looking like it's going to be ticking back up, which most signs are pointing towards it. The employment numbers are pointing towards it. Uh, beer prices are stabilizing. Inflation stabilizing. Things are actually probably going to look pretty decent for Budweiser as a company uh, by July 4th. Usually, Memorial Day weekend is when things start popping off. So, if I had money to spend on stocks, what I would do is wait another like three to four weeks at most, buy up some Bud stock right before Memorial Day weekend, and then ride the Memorial Day weekend, July 4th weekend pop that we're inevitably going to see. And then, if things aren't looking good, sell sometimes around football season kickoff. That would be my recommendation with Bud. Constellation. I think is a really interesting story of, uh, I don't have a recommendation for buy or sell right now, but uh, Constellation, which is ticker symbol STZ, very expensive, $260. Mike, do you know what it was when Constellation, the company that owns Corona, do you know what their stock price was once the coronavirus lockdowns happened? It dropped and I had forgotten that like there was this whole thing that people, <laughs> Americans were stupid enough to, to think that corona, you could get coronavirus from Corona beer. Yes. And so yes. there was a whole, it fell off for a bit. Yep. Um, so I don't know what it was, but it, but it did have an artificial dip. And that was the thing about the dip was that it was clearly, it yep. wasn't based on anything. It wasn't even based on, on fabricated outrage like Bud Light. It was just based purely on Fear. <laughs> and stupidity. It drops to $130. It's doubled since the low oh, of the lockdown. So also, again, if we had money at the time, uh, that would have been a great stock to jump on. Mm -hmm. But we unfortunately are just um, backseat stock drivers. We aren't actually stock owners. But that's how it goes when you own a craft brewery. Mike? Yeah. 
I don't even own a craft brewery. Have a good week. Cheers.